all about the opening weekend for a movie. So if I my movie kick, kicks in into the cinemas this weekend on the Friday, I've got Friday, Saturday, Sunday to make all my money because I'm getting 90% of the revenue and the cinema is only getting 10. Now, after the weekend, the cinema gets 90% and Peter only gets 10%. So that's why you'll always notice that it's all about that opening weekend, guys, for a production company. Peter. Wow. 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 All right, everyone, welcome back. Today, this is going to be a fun podcast. We're going to talk about how the Hollywood movie industry works, kind of behind the scenes, because, guys, I was living in L.A. for a couple of years, as many of you may or may not know, and I was going to act. I love acting. I think it's great. I nearly got to a stage where I got on a uh, an ABC show called What About Brian? Now, that season only lasted for one year obviously didn't do very very well with the audiences but I got close enough but hey close is never getting the the full shilling so whatever but guys it's uh it's 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 a complicated business and a lot of people don't know the ins and outs and here's what I'm gonna divulge to you of what I've found out about the movie industry and I think these are really fascinating because you'd be amazed you'd be absolutely amazed what how things work and People don't realize, for instance, let's start off with this. They have to make a killing, a new movie, in that first opening weekend. Now, what do I mean? Do you know the way we all watch a movie uh, or a, let's say, a, a, a trailer or an ad on TV, right, for the new movie coming out? And it's out, coming this Friday. And it's all about that weekend. Now, why are they advertising this, the first weekend. Well, obviously they want to advertise their their new movie, but at the same time, why is there such a push? As in, you might realize or might notice that it's they always put ninety percent of their advertising about a week before the movie comes out, and they always mark it. Oh, coming this Friday, or coming this Thursday night at twelve oh one. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And why do they do this? Well, the way Hollywood works is, let's say Peter's got a new movie coming out, right? Peter Walsh movie, whatever the fuck we'll call it, okay? So Peter makes the movie, he's done all that, he's edited it, it's ready to go. So I get to my distributors and they send it out into the movie theaters nationwide or even limited theaters. Or they put it out worldwide, okay? But whatever deal and agreement you have, and money, of course, it takes a lot of money to do this. But also, now, at the weekend, Peter has now an agreement with all the cinemas that if Peter releases the movie, Peter makes 90% of the revenue on the opening weekend. And the cinemas get 10%. All right? This is true. It's all about the opening weekend for a movie. So if I my movie kick, kicks in into the cinemas this weekend on the Friday... I've got Friday, Saturday, Sunday to make all my money because I'm getting 90% of the revenue and the cinema is only getting 10. Now, after the weekend, the cinema gets 90% and Peter only gets 10%. So that's why you'll always notice that it's all about that opening weekend, guys, for a production company. It's, It's extremely important. And also what you have as well, you might, you might have noticed this. Now, they don't do it all the time, but sometimes the, the cinemas will have, let's say, a, uh, 12, o- a 12 o'clock on a Thursday night, but a 12.01 as well. Now, you, obviously, that's 12.01 rolls into Friday. Guess what? It's now a Friday. So they're, getting, they're gaining an extra little bit if they have a 12.01 on that Friday morning, obviously. It's technically Friday morning, right? So that's how that works. And it's very fascinating. But again, it's it just puts so much pressure on the production company, Peter Welsh Productions, with this new movie coming out, that it's, it, it, it's tough, especially now these days when you have Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the online streaming services. Now it's getting even tougher. And... 
it, it, it's it, it's very it's fascinating and you know you find this out at the start and you're like oh that makes fucking sense jesus christ so let's move on to the next one so here's another one as well you'll always notice in the titles at the opening of a movie or at the end of a movie or a tv program you'll always see that the first name comes up okay so let's say again we'll just go with me peter is in some movie right if my name comes up first in the title that means i'm technically the star actor our actress or whoever it is but now there's a lot of times where actors and the agents and production company they'll actually fight over who gets the first credit as in the first name to appear there's a big debate about this sometimes with, with some movies because if you have two stars let's say you got Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe right oh actually <laughs> I didn't even think about it. you got Denzel and Russell in American Gangster okay great movie and their agents had to go up against each other and go right who's getting the fucking opening credit here boys who's getting the first title because whoever's first whoever's name appears first is technically the lead actor so if you got Russell coming out first then Denzel's name Russell's the, the main, is the lead actor and Denzel is the supporting actor now then it flips over as well where if you'll also notice at the end credits where, or sorry, the opening and end credits where you'll see Russell, Denzel, Meryl Streep, da -da, they go through all the names. But then at the end, you'll also notice they can have with Peter Walsh and Jack Nicholson, right? Now, why do they have with and and? With is not a huge one. Uh, it doesn't give you much. But the and one now, that's a big one. So if you don't get the lead actor title at, at the start and at the end, the next one really is the and. Because then it, it sort of gives you a bit more of a credibility. You look like a, a special guest star. And there's a lot of weight. It's, it's like real estate. It's like great location. So they always shoot for the opening title. That's the lead actor. Anything after number one is supporting. But then if you get the and and Samuel L. Jackson, whatever it is, that's a big one too. All right, let's move on. What do we have next? Scripts, a lot of people don't know this. A normal movie script is normally about 120 pages long. Now, of course, like if you were making a script right now, they would tell you in acting, uh, sorry, in screenwriting class or wherever it is, that you're, you should be shooting for 120 pages. That would be a feature length film. Now that would be roughly in time, that would probably be about a, well, hour 45 minute movie, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. But that's what a lot of people go for, 120 pages. And the beautiful thing about making movies, because even like, what's his name, James Gandolfini in The Sopranos, I was watching a documentary on him recently, and they were saying that Gandolfini was working 16 hours a day he because he was basically in every single episode he was always on on site on set and the guy was working his ass off every fucking day movies are a bit more relaxed because even if you have your star your star actor they're probably only shooting about four to five pages of your script every single day now there is other movies out there that they they really want to cram it in tight and i think what was it the the recent one there oppenheimer the killian murphy robert downey jr matt damon that one i think they shot that within like five or six weeks don't quote me exactly on that one but there is even if i'm wrong about that one i'm pretty sure it's oppenheimer but they do a lot of that as well where they'll have to cram it in i actually remember even phone booth colin farrell they shot that in like a couple of weeks or something. It was insane. So sometimes they do actually go off the boil and cram it in. But in a normal, a normal production time, they're doing four or five pages. And it can be very boring for a lot of the actors and actresses. It can be just... Yeah, just cramming it out. A lot of people don't know this one. And... People kind of get confused or people just haven't thought about it. A lot of people think 
that the music that you see in a scene, in a movie scene, or even a TV program, a lot of people think that as they're acting, the song is playing while they're on set. So let's say Denzel's going for some big aggression scene or crying scene. People think that the music that you hear is actually playing on set. Now, I'm not speaking for everybody, of course, but a lot of people do think that. And that's not the case. In fact, the actor doesn't even know what kind of music that's going to be playing at all when he's doing his performance. It's after they wrap up the movie, they then bring it to Hans Zimmer or whoever it is, and then they put in the the music afterwards. And you know what? What you should do, guys, actually, to, to, to see what I mean, you should YouTube Star Wars Episode Four ending scene, no music. Okay? Now... Even if you're a Star Wars fan or you're not, this is actually, it's a really cool thing to see and really weird at the same time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that scene, okay? At the this ending scene, when you watch the actual final cut of the movie, you see Harrison Ford, who's Han Solo, uh, Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia, and Chewie, right? Now, Han... At Solo and Luke Skywalker, they're walking down an aisle to collect a... I think, aren't they getting a medal? Anyway, whatever it is. But there's a huge crowd. They're there to, to, pick the, to, to pick up their award, right? Their heroes. And in, in the actual final cut of the actual movie, they've got the music. Dun, da, 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 da. All this, right? And it's fucking brilliant. Now, go to YouTube and watch that scene with no fucking music. You'll go... Holy shit. And try and do a before and after as well if you've never seen the movie, okay? Even if you're... An, if you, even if you fucking hate Star Wars, it's a great example of the behind the scenes of the movie business. I mean, it really, it, it'll probably even freak you out, I'd say, actually. It's so fucking bizarre. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, okay, let's move it on. So what else do we have? Now bear with me guys, I'm looking through my, my list of notes here. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything out here for you. Oh, this is a big one too. A lot of people don't know this. That there's, obviously you have screenplay writers, okay? They write scripts for a movie. But a lot of them actually have a big movie star in mind. So for instance, we can all see, like, the difference between Denzel versus Al Pacino, let's say, right? Al Pacino always has this sort of... Uh, what would you call it? I don't even know. I'm trying to find the words for this one now, but... Pacino would be... He's telling you the ways of life, right? And the, the, the deep voice and this sort of thing. Whereas Denzel would be the, the energetic, fiery... Like, wow, right? You know, two different ranges of actors, but you'd and but it's their style of acting. It's what draws people into them. So you could have a, a movie star or a movie script writer, and he will literally have an idea in mind. Okay, you know what? I want Denzel on my next movie. And he'll literally write it the way Denzel has, has expressed himself in other movies, believe it or not. And... Sometimes, if the, if it's a big risk for a lot of the writers, because if Denzel doesn't like the fucking script, well, you could be fucked because you can't put in Russell Crowe or Al Pacino into to do a Denzel script. Now, sometimes they can sort of change it around a bit, but you know that that's hard work, guys. You know, and it's a big risk. Denzel doesn't like it. What do you do? Do you toss it into the fucking bin? Your whole 120 pages? You know, it's, uh, it's a cutthroat business. It really is. And, you know, a lot of the scripts then, if they don't gear it for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the actor, a lot of the time, what they'll do is they'll create a sort of a neutral script, right? So in other words, okay, I'm Peter's screenwriter, I'm gonna create this script, I'll, I've got two or three stars in mind. So they'll purposely then, because they don't wanna fall into that trap, if Denzel says, no, well I'm fucked, 
all this time wasted. So they'll make a bit of a more of a neutral script and they'll have two or three actors in mind. But at least they've got that flexibility to know that, well, hey, you know, if I don't get Pacino, I can get Denzel for this. Absolutely. Like, for instance, a great one actually is Seven. And maybe, maybe you've seen it, guys. It's a great movie, even to this day. I mean, I think this movie's like 20, 25 years old at this stage. It's a fantastic movie. You've got uh, uh, Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, Gwyneth Paltrow. Fucking fantastic movie. Kevin Spacey as well. And originally, they wanted Al Pacino to play the Morgan Freeman role. And they wanted Denzel to play the Brad Pitt role. So, like, they went from wanting a white guy playing the lead actor role. Pacino didn't want it. He turned it away. He turned it down. Then they said, well, actually, we can change this up. We're going to go with a black man, and we'll go with Morgan Freeman. And he was brilliant in it anyway. And then they reversed it around as well for the supporting actor. They wanted Denzel as a supporting actor. Didn't go for it. And what did they do? They went to a white guy, a Brad Pitt. And... I mean, uh, do you know what? I, even when I watch that movie, I just can imagine, like, can you imagine Al Pacino and Denzel in that fucking movie? Holy shit. I think Morgan Freeman was great. Brad Pitt was great. Gwen Gwyneth Paltrow, she was great too. But I just can't stop thinking about Pacino and... Jesus, Pacino and Denzel in that fucking movie, man. Oh my god. That would have been incredible. Anyway, my point is, is that they can have that flexibility. Even for The Godfather, a lot of people don't know this one. Nicholson, Jack Nicholson, was the one of the preferred choices to play the Brando character. And if you don't know, Brando character in Godfather 1 is the dad, right? The, what do they call him again? The Corleone? Uh, the main guy, the head of the, the, the father, the head of the whole crime family. And he was, I mean, Brando, Jesus Christ, he's the greatest of all time anyway. But they wanted Nicholson in that role. Nicholson said, no, I'm not, I'm not right for this, guys. I'm not right for this. And in fairness to him, you know, any actor worth his salt isn't going to take a movie script just even though it's the worst thing and it doesn't suit him or her. Sometimes they'll say no because they have to. It's not, it's not in them, you know? And you, you got to respect that. That's it's always great. It's always great. And another one for you is we have agents. Now, this is a good one, I think. A lot of people know that, yeah, okay, well, you've got actors who've got agents. Now, like the big, uh, the big ones are William Morris, Endeavor, CAA. They're the big ones now. They'd be located in Los Angeles, New York, London, probably Australia, other offices around the world. But they'd be the big three now, right? CAA, Endeavor, William Morris. And they'd have all the big fucking stars. All the big stars. And a lot of people don't know that it's not just actors. And this is why a lot of times that a production company can find it I wouldn't say easy, but it's easier to get your cast together because you could go to, let's say, Peter is with William Morris as a, an actor, okay? I've got my agent in William Morris. I come along with a script, let's say, okay? I write a script out. I'd say, okay, agent, can you give me some of your, your directors or your screenwriters to adapt and help me do this? Because an agent will not just have actors... An agent will also have directors like Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, all the other actors, all the di directors, uh, all the directors in Hollywood need an agent also. And not just that, all the screenwriters need agents as well. It's, not, it's, it's a big business, guys. And therefore, an agent can easily then bring a lot of his own clients or her clients together for that movie. So you could have... Peter, who's the screenwriter, he brings it to his agent. Okay, Agent X, I need lead actor, supporting actor. Who do you have? Now, the agent will normally go to his own fucking database of his own clients. Of course he would. Why wouldn't he? And then go from there. Now, if they're not right for the part, well, then that's understandable. But that's how it can work over there. And they say, well, they do say that a lot of these uh, a lot of these movies you need the right person for the role 
I mean, even if we look back at seven, I, I like, by the way, guys, I'm a huge fan of Brad Pitt. I love him. I think he's fucking brilliant. It would, it would be hard to replace a Brad Pitt for charisma on screen. The guy will go down in history as one of the, just the, the coolest fucking guys on screen of all time. He's unreal. And I just didn't think he was good for the Brad Pitt seven role. Either the seven role, should I say. You know, he was a bit too fiery, I thought. I thought. Do you know? Like, can you imagine Denzel when they're saying, What's in the box? Can you imagine Denzel fucking delivering that line? Holy shit. And he's getting angry and he's fucking pointing. Jesus, man. I, dynamite, I'd say. And then Pacino? You see, I always go back to this. Oh, I gotta let it go. I gotta let it go. Sometimes you wish you don't hear this shit, huh? Jesus. Okay. Anyway. Another one for you. People don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. So, for instance, you could have your 120-page script, and let's say it's uh, Let's give an example here. It could be a movie on rugby. Okay, let's say. And in the, in the script, you've got the, the final match, right? At the, at the end of the movie, obviously, it all builds to the end, the, at the climax, and bang, Peter and his rugby team win, right? Whatever it is. But sometimes, they won't shoot it in order. So, depending on their budget, or depending on availability of a certain location, they might have to actually film the the ending scene right at the start or even in the middle I mean it, it can be all over the place so it is very important that the actor knows what the emotion of the scene's gonna be because again it could be a you know oh my god if I don't win this rugby match or we, we all go down we're never ever gonna play rugby again so it's a highly emotional scene but yet it's your first fucking scene in the movie <laughs> that you're gonna be shooting so it, it's always scattered around quite a lot. So it's very, very important that the, the actor or actress, they know and understand the script. Now, then again, you've got movies like A Beautiful Mind. And that's not the only movie out there. A Beautiful Mind, Russell Crowe and Jennifer Connelly. Great movie, by the way, guys. It won the Oscar for Best Picture. Not, uh, Russell Crowe was nominated. Uh, Je did I say Jennifer Lawrence? Uh, Jennifer Connelly? Did I say Jennifer Connelly? Yeah, Jennifer Connelly. She was the, the lead actress. She won the Oscar for, the, for her role. Russell was nominated. It moved, it won Best Picture. Fantastic fucking movie. In fact, I put that in my head now. I might actually watch that this weekend. Why not? Why not? But anyway, my point is, guys, is that they actually shot the movie in order. So the very first scene you see in the movie is the very first day on location shooting. Kind of weird, but it's kind of weird actually that it is. I mean, it makes logical sense when you think about it. Well, why not shoot it in order? Easier, right? That would make sense. But the more you kind of study movies and be around it, it doesn't make sense. It's weird that it it's weird that the logical way is weird. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Uh, acting techniques. Now, this is fun. I, I like this one now. And, you know, you'd be amazed, guys, right? Watch this now the next time you watch out for... Uh, uh, watch your next movie. A lot of the time, a lot of actors whisper, or they keep it very low, right? So if I'm doing this, if I'm whispering right now, it adds intensity. Now, I'm whispering. Now, if you were over 10 foot away from me right now, you probably wouldn't hear me. Even if you were on set watching Peter do his, his acting scene. I'm whispering, but the thing is, the mic is actually picking up your voice. And they can add in a little bit more bass. They can add in a bit more treble. But a lot of them whisper and, like... A good guy to look out for in this in this one is Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin's always very low, very down, very down, and very throaty. Al Pacino, all this sort of deep, oh, that's right. 
Okay, I'm doing the worst Pacino voice ever. But watch that the next time. And do you know something? Even I know this from acting, guys. Like, if anybody walked into my studio right here, right now, I might sound loud to you, depending on, of course, your volume. But someone outside my door here, they wouldn't hear me. They'd barely hear me because they're not listening through a microphone. The microphone is magnifying my voice. Now, I'm actually talking quite low when I'm talking into this right now. But to you guys, it could be loud because the microphone is magnifying everything. And it's, it's quite cool that way. It's quite cool. And, okay, let's have a look. What's next? And... Oh yeah, this is a great one. Brando was the original for this. Overacting, or simplifying acting, and letting the audience decide that you're emotional. Here's an example. Brando, I heard this in acting class, he was the greatest actor of all time. He's the Ayrton Senna of fucking acting. And all the big stars think it, De Niro, Pacino, Meryl Streep, they all think it, Nicholson, they all think he's the best, Robert Duvall. And Brando was in class one day, and the acting teacher was saying to, to everybody in class, okay guys, we want to do a bit of improv improvisation here. So everybody has to go up on stage in front of everybody else, one by one, and they had to go up, sit in a chair, and the scenario, they painted the picture. The scenario was, in 30 seconds time, the world's going to end. What do you do? That's all the notes they had. That was it. And the actor had to, okay, well, imagine this. What do I do? What, do I start freaking out? Do I panic? So everybody was going up and, uh, and then they added another layer to it. Then they said, right. The acting teacher stopped them and said, right, okay. Now we're going to change this up, guys. We're going to amp, amp it up. Now what I want you to do is imagine you're a chicken and the world's going to end in 30 seconds. What do you do? So everybody goes up again and there was people flailing around the, the, the stage, roaming around going, oh, bark, 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 all this bullshit, right? And they were using their hands and everything. Brando goes up and he sits in the fucking chair and does nothing. The acting teacher stops him and says, uh, Marlon, what are you doing? Marlon says, well, I'm a chicken, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know the world's going to end in 30 seconds. The teacher says, well, no, but you do know this. He goes, but that's not real. How the fuck does a chicken know the world's going to end in 30 seconds? The teacher had nothing on him. He literally just sat there, and apparently it was like... It was really riveting. It was it was gripping the way he just sat there and he just stared into fucking space. I mean, that guy, he could have read you the phone book and you'd be like, oh my God, oh my God. And here's another classic example of uh, keeping the acting low down where you let the audience decide that Marlon is upset here. Here's the example. In Godfather 1, and if you've never seen it or you're gonna watch it again, Keep an eye on this. We find out in Godfather that Sonny, Marlon's, Marlon's son in the movie, has been killed. So uh, James, uh, Robert Duvall is one of his sons as well. So Robert Duvall uh, comes back in. And can you imagine this is a scenario in real life? Your son walks into the house, tells the dad that his other son has died, or has been killed. Now, in real life, you'd bawl your eyes out, you'd start panicking, you'd freak your shit, right? You know, it would be a horrendous reaction, and understandably, of course, right? But Marlin just stands there, looks down at the, at the ground, doesn't start crying, doesn't start shouting, doesn't start screaming, and he takes a deep breath, and he just goes, <sighs> takes a deep breath, looks up to the sky, and that's it. And then he continues to talk. He's, he goes, I want inquiries made. In other words, he wants to get to the bottom of what the fuck happened. 
Now, in real life, do you really think that a father hearing that his son has died, do you really think that he's going to start talking about he's focused within five seconds and go, right, guys, I want inquiries made, this and that and that. Right? You'd be thinking the guy's a psychopath if that was the case. But in this case, Marlon just literally does exactly what I was just saying. He looks up to the sky. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. He's calm as fuck. And then he continues on with his speech. Now, the beauty of it is, you can see Marlon Brando's heart break and shatter into a million fucking pieces. But the thing is, he's not overplaying it. He's not trying to, okay, well, I have to be fucking crying my eyes out now or freaking out to make the scene good. No, we get it. Like, we get it watching Brando do that. He just stands there, looks up to the, to the heavens, and you know his fucking heart is broken. It, 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 first of all, incredible piece of acting, but a lot of people have learned from Brando, and keep an eye on that the next time. You know, if you do have an interest in this, well, okay, so that guy's best friend or his wife has died, right? Well, he should be freaking out, panicking, but maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't. But again, guys, if you want to watch that YouTube that when Sonny dies and Brando finds out, and it's just, it's incredible. It really is. It's And this is, like, this is done in back in the 50s, I think. Was it Godfather? I can't remember, but this is a way back. And this is when actors were loud. They were like theater actors, you know? They were frailing their hands around the place, being very, very dramatic. And Brando comes along, nah, fuck this, that's a lot of bollocks. And he does it his own way. And everybody since then has learned from Brando. And I'm telling you guys, Marlon fucking Brando is just... He's the man. He is the fucking man. It's incredible. And okay, other one as well. This happens for pretty much most actors these days, and Brando was, well, the guy to start off this, really. Watch the way you're watching a, a, a scene in a program or a movie next time, and see the way a lot of their face doesn't move much, right? They're almost just staring. Now, if you're watching me on YouTube, I'll do it. They're just staring at the camera, or they're staring at the person that they're looking at, but yet you can feel a lot of their emotion. Now, the thing is, if I just stare at the camera right now, which I'm doing, well, you might think, okay, is Peter freaking out? Is he upset? Is he happy? But see, that's the thing. It's the audience decides what emotion I'm going through right now. Now, maybe I've got a blank look on my face, whatever it is, but you'll notice in a lot of these scenes, keep an eye. They're not looking around left, right, blinking this, right, or they're not big fucking reactions, right? A lot of things are very slow, very low down, very still, and that because it's kind of like the microphone, the camera picks up a lot of your facial expression. So if Peter looks to the right off camera now, well, I could only be looking about maybe two or three inches away from what I just looked, right? A very, very slant look I've just given away from the camera. But on the camera, that could look like I'm looking about five or six foot away in a different direction. So again, it's the acting technique is very, very uh, uh, it, it's, it's a fucking science. It's a fucking science. So in fact, I'll do that again. So because I actually had we had the wrong camera on that one, guys. Jesus, we're terrible. So like Peter stares at the, the camera. Now, you might think I've got a blank expression. You might think I'm upset about something. I'm happy about something or anything. But if I look away now, it probably looks like a big movement or maybe not. But if they look only two or three inches away on screen, that looks like they're looking two or three foot away. Big, big difference. And in theater, it would be completely different because you have a big screen, uh, a big audience right in front of you, which is obviously a completely different animal when you're when you're doing theater versus TV. And okay, let's move it on. And here's another one, and we're going to close off with this one. 
Watch this. Watch out for this as well in a uh, in any TV program or a movie. You might see this where like. Here's one good one for you. An example: Al Pacino and Heat. I only watched this there recently. So Pacino's trying to figure out who the uh, the the burglars are. Okay, there was a bu a gang. They steal stuff. Pacino's the detective trying to figure out. So Pacino gets a lead. He goes over to this guy and he sits down and he goes, "Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta give me some information. You gotta sort me out here. You gotta help me out." And Pacino's sitting there, and he goes through it. He's very calm when he's talking, but at the end of it, he lifts the table, shoves crap off the table, and right there and then, you can tell that his character is pissed off. Now, Pacino's not going, give me that fucking... He's not screaming right there and then when he's shoving the stuff off the table. No, he's not, right? Whereas, normally you'd think, oh, well, actually, I better shout now on this one here, you know, because I need to show that I'm angry. No. Instead, he lets the table do the work for him, so to speak. So, he just is nice and calm, and he goes, <laughs> slams the table, does something like this. People then automatically know, oh, his character's pissed. So it's a kind of like a, it wouldn't be a cheat for acting, but it's a, it's a help. It's a big help. So it's just great, man. It's fascinating the way a lot of this stuff plays out and stuff that you wouldn't pick up when you're watching a TV program or a movie, but maybe it'll, maybe it's useful to you guys or entertaining. Keep an eye out for the next time. I would definitely YouTube before I go, I'll just let you know. Again, we'll just remind you. YouTube Star Wars Episode 4 End scene, no music. Then go to the same scene with music. You'll see the difference. Check out Brando in The Godfather 1. In fact, if you don't want to watch the movie, you can probably YouTube this as well. And just go to the scene where uh, Tom, that's right, Tom, the, the son's name. Tom tells Brando that Sonny has died. And watch Brando the way he's just standing there, looks up to space, and that's it. I mean, if that was real life, you'd be thinking that the father was a fucking whack job, psycho. You know, does he even give a shit? But in the movie, you think, oh my god, his heart's broken. And watch Pacino and Heat. YouTube that as well, maybe. Watch the way he, he fucking shoves everything off the table. Right there and then, he didn't have to portray anger. He just literally showed his anger by fucking shoving the table off in front of him. So, anyway guys, that's the Hollywood movie industry. Hope it was uh, insightful. And I'll be back again, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Peter. Wow. 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 Wow.